on this episode, storytelling superstar Morgan Spurlock stops by. Gary Vay Nurchuk, and this is episode 256 of the Ask Gary V Show. I'm super fired up for this phenomenal guest. It's ironic. This is really the first time we're jamming. Yeah. We've it is. we've interacted a little bit on Twitter. Yeah. Then we ran into each other <laughs> on a the, plane. On a plane. <laughs> I was like, hey, you should come in. Like, that, no, the best part is, like, then you walked by, and then I DM'd you. I was like, hey, you should be a guest on the Ask Gary V Show. You're like, sure. Yeah. And here we are, two weeks later, Morgan. <laughs> Why don't you tell the one person from the Vayner Nation who doesn't know who you are, uh, how you describe yourself now and we'll get into this show. We're gonna have uh, Facebook if you're watching. So what are we doing, taking phone calls from where? Facebook? Facebook. Fa- so Instagram peeps, go over to Facebook Live. Uh, if you wanna get your uh, questions in, put your phone numbers into Facebook. Uh, Morgan and I are gonna take four or five calls depending on how much we yap. That's right. But, uh, but for that one and a half person yeah, no, that doesn't uh, know who you are. So, yeah, my name's Morgan Spurlock. I am a, a filmmaker, a producer, a writer, but mostly I, I am a professional storyteller. That's what I do. That's how you go with. Yeah. Which makes sense. Yeah. So Morgan, take, be- before we go into questions, I want to get some background. Not to be confused with like an amateur storyteller. No, I get, listen, <laughs> listen, it's it's really cra- it's really crazy. That means I actually get paid once in a while. That's the good part. <laughs> That's the key. Not all the time, but sometimes I actually get paid for it. Well, you know what? It's funny. I think I think professional storytellers um, just get paid, right? Like I think they can come from anywhere. That's right. Whether they make big Hollywood films or no, if they make an Instagram channel, like could be anywhere. Yeah. That's right. Uh, so. Take me all the way back. When did you realize you were a storyteller? Were you the kind of kid that was a movie buff? Like oh, yeah. you wanted to be Steven Spielberg when you were a kid? Oh, like, no, ever, give, it, me, give it to me. I, when I was a kid growing up in West Virginia, um, I mean, for as long as I can remember, I loved movies, I loved TV, I loved the entertainment business in general, and all I ever wanted to do was make movies. And I mean, for as far back as I can remember, five, six years old, like that was my, that was my dream. And, and now here I am, you know, 41 years later, and it's my life, and it's awesome to kind of see just how this all came to be. So you're 41 years old? 46 years old. 46, so at yeah, five, got it. Right. Okay, so so, it, what about West Virginia? I don't think of yeah. that as like LA or hot New York. Hotbed of entertainment. Yeah, like that what, is the hotbed of the entertainment and is, business. And this is now you know, right. thir- 40 years ago, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. 35 years well, ago. I had amazing parents. Like my mom and dad, You know, God bless these guys, they are the greatest. I was just talking to my mom as I was falling down on your street outside. Nice street, by the way. <laughs> Thank like, you. you can't, like, outside, there are like giant, there's giant construction work. There's like a giant rat. Like So there's obviously something going wrong in your building. There's a giant inflatable sure. rat outside. What does that usually mean? Union? <laughs> it's union, it's union it. thing. It's union yeah. thing. So uh, I was talking to my mom right before I came in, but when I was growing up in West Virginia, I had these two amazing parents that loved the arts, were so supportive of the arts. I was the youngest of three ballet dancing brothers. Like my Is oldest, that right? Yeah, my oldest brother, Craig, went on to become a professional dancer, as did my middle brother. Um, That's cool. Yeah, it's my amazing. My favorite it, it, football. Not the cool thing to be doing in West Virginia, but an awesome thing to like have parents that will support you saying, if that's what you want to do, we're on board. So what's yeah. interesting about that is my all-time favorite football player is Al Toon. Yeah. And what he would do in the offseason as a wide receiver in the 80s was go, I mean, it's a football player. Yeah. And he did ballet and he equates a lot of his success to that. I, I gave me so much coordination. It gave me so much confidence. It made me a much better athlete. It made um, you confident because when kids were like, you do ballet, you had to figure out how to rebuttal that. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It gave me a much better sense of humor because <laughs> I would usually just make fun of myself. Of course. For doing it. So uh, I think the self-deprecation has kind of lived on in my life. So what's the first break or what's the start of your career where do you what do you wh- how does this happen do you go to school for it yeah do you I mean, make, I think it was, what I think, happened I think it was when I got into film school like I, I went and to Southern was that? Cal okay I, at first I went to Southern Cal hoping to get in, into USC so film you, school. you were able to get into USC I got into USC broadcast journalism which is huge which is so, huge right like yeah. like you were like holy shit like yes I'm going to USC yeah and I didn't get into the film school but every semester I kept applying to the <laughs> yeah, film yeah. school and every semester I kept getting rejected from yes. the film school I got, they're got, like you'll never make it that's right got rejected five times from the USC film school finally the last time I was like well I gotta apply somewhere else like I keep putting all my eggs in this basket right it's, and the, the shittiest part like here's what an idiot I was at the time I wouldn't apply to UCLA just out of principle right because after going to USC he was like I can't go to USC yeah like, what an, what an U- idiot UCLA, I was. Yeah. what an idiot yeah because UCLA is beautiful like like USC is in the middle of Watts like it's in the yes. middle of, like downtown Los yes. Angeles UCLA is over in Westwood the most beautiful nice. provincial yeah. campus ever but I wouldn't apply there so I, I applied to NYU and I got in and yes. I came to New York been here since 1991 so you got into NYU and never, film, and and never, never left. left. And so what happens next? 
Well, I mean, I think NYU, the best part about this school in New York City in general is New York City's really good at trimming the fat. And I think, uh, I think it's a great city that automatically helps you, A, either find your place in the business you're in, find your place in what you want to do. Or get the hell out. Or get out. And I, and I think the film school also did that, is it really forced me to kind of come in, focus, and, you know, bust my ass through school and, and kind of get what I wanted. Were you able to look around and be like, oh, that... That kid's talented. She's talented. Like, did it kind of give you Listen, perspective? I, I mean, I went to film school with kids who were infinitely more gifted than than I was, who were infinitely more talented, better storytellers, artists. better DPs, artists, like yes. proper artists, who are now really great real estate brokers and really great accountants, yeah. you know, people who... So what do you equate your ability to break through and what everybody aspired to do yeah. in a world where they didn't achieve that and you did I think, like I think, honestly but I gotta be honest especially because this is an entrepreneur tenacity. format I mean I think a lot of it is tenacity I, th- I think you I think it's you're not only willing it but you don't quit I think quitting yeah. is easy that's the other thing is a lot of people give up quitting is the easiest thing in the world and and I just um, I don't know I, I just yeah my, I grew up with parents amazing parents yep. who were like whatever you start you finish yeah you never like no matter what it was like if I wanted to quit <laughs> baseball they were like nope you're nope. finishing the whole season you I never love. I was never able to quit anything and so interesting I, and I grew up you know, with my father, who's an entrepreneur, who started a business out of our garage that grew into a huge business. And so, I mean, for me, it was always about, I've got to stay the course. I've got to see it through. So what's the first break in MS's first career? Real, I mean, first real break, there were so many great ones. Like right out of film school, like the very first job I ever got was um, being a PA on The Professional, which I look back as like being such like a, because it was like, I was, I was being, I was an intern at Robert De Niro's production company down at uh, the Tribeca Film Center at the films. And I kept, I kept, you know, badgering all of the other film productions there. You know, like, can I get a job? I was about to graduate. I had yeah. no employment. Yeah, My yeah. mom and dad were like, you better find a job. Right. We're not paying <laughs> so for shit. We're not going to yeah. be there. We're not yep. helping you. You better find a job. Yep. And so every day I kept going to the production offices. I was like, Hey, are you hiring anybody? Are you hiring anybody? Finally, I went to the, it was, I had two weeks left of school and like the production coordinator for for Leon was what the film was called at the time, the professional, what it became when it came out, said, oh, Morgan, do you speak Spanish? I said, si, mi español es muy bien. And they said, we need a PA who can speak Spanish. I said, okay, yes, I'm your guy. So they hired me. So I was like, oh my God, I got a job. This is fantastic. Was that the only sentence you knew in Spanish? I knew a few more. Like, okay. ¿Dónde está la biblioteca? Mi lápiz es amarillo en grande. Okay, so you had something. Oh, me gusta su perro. You know? Now like, you're just bragging. Stop. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew, I, knew a play, I knew enough words where I could bullshit my way into it. So yes. it got to about a month later as we're in production. And we're way up on the Upper West Side in like Washington Heights. And we're shooting a scene. And all of a sudden, this woman is screaming at the person. She's like, ah, la, 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 screaming at the, at the production coordinator in Spanish. And like, uh, we need Morgan to come down to the corner right now. So I come down to the corner <laughs> and she's screaming and yelling and pointing and they're like, what, what is she saying? And I was like, she's really mad. <laughs> she's, I'm listening and I'm just like, she says, you bad people, people and all of this is bad. You need to go. And you're like, you don't understand what she's saying at all. I said, I'm understanding pieces. And they're like, get out of here. <laughs> By that point, I'd already kind of ingratiated my way into the job. So I didn't get fired. They kept me around, but, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't quite tell the uh, tell the whole truth in my Spanish abilities. And you're so right, right? It's always building blocks. What was the big break that is like the Hollywood headline or the, the thing that, ever, like, sure. in the limited time we have together? Oh, I what mean, was... no, the biggest, the biggest thing that happened was like when we made Super Size Me and that went to Sundance, me, it changed everything. Like, I made a movie. What were you doing before that? Right, because that's I obviously sold, when well, I... Was the thing. Back in 1999, I started my first company. Yes. Um, which was a web-based company called the Interactive Consortium where I was, you know, I was in the middle of the tech boom. I said, sure. I want to create a company that produces programming online. Yes. And then springboard it off to film or television. Understood. And so as everybody was raising money, did and Pseudo Pop, UBO, UGO, yes, yes, Icebox. Yes. And these companies were raising hundreds of millions of dollars. I put together my business plan. We were trying to raise about eight. We had a few people that were on the hook. We were about to close. And then March 2000 happened. And everything right. went, <laughs> all the money went away. Yep. Nobody was writing a check for anything. And I was like, fuck, what do we do now? Yeah. Um, and there was one guy that was still interested. So I went and met this one guy in a bar, Marty Garvey, who <laughs> he said, who's amazing. Marty. So I went and met him in a bar. And he said, he goes, I don't know anything about content. He goes, I don't ever invest in like crazy ideas. He goes, I invest in people. And he goes, and I don't know if this will work. He goes, but I believe in you. And he wrote me a check for 250 grand in the bar. Um, and, and were you like, what the hell just happened? I was, well, I was like, I was like, was this, this real? This is going to I was like, is this real? Yeah. And he goes, and he goes, you should put that away. And so I folded it up and put it in my sock. And you, know, you ask yourself, well, how long do I sit and drink at a bar with somebody who just wrote me a check for $250,000? And the answer is as long as they want. Yeah, that's and right. So we stayed in that bar and drank all night until they threw us out. And then the next day I went back to the guys because I already had people in the office working yeah. on this company. And they were like, well, let's, that's great. Let's get started. And so at, back in 2000, there were, there were, 
there was no reality television. That's, that's right. That's crazy to think about. That's right. Um, but there was a game show that had just come back to television called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I remember. And it, went, and it went from one night a week to two nights a week yeah, it was to four nights like, a week. Yeah, it, was like, it took over the whole summer. It took over the whole summer. It that's became right. huge. Yes. It was spring into summer. And I said, we got to make a game show. And so we made a game show called I Bet You Will, where I would go out on the street and bet people to do stupid things for money. (laughs) Um, We launched the show in May of that year, the first day online, IBetYouWill.com. Right, because by the way, for all the youngsters, no YouTube, no social media. No. You just put up a URL and it was expensive to stream. Yeah. Like literally the first day, the the site exploded. Like word got out. Like I was getting picked up by all these TV and radio stations and doing promos for it. Why did that happen? Because the show was, uh, there wasn't a show but really. But somebody like, was the first seeder to match. Did you have a relationship? Well, Did like some no, PR friend do something? No, it was like, it was like somebody, something? somebody had seen it and literally called. Um, like so like we were out shooting one day and the Village Voice did a story after seeing I a see. shoot one day. Um, Opie and Anthony, when they were on, were like, oh my gosh, you have to see this show. Well, so then they brought it. us. That's all you needed. And so then I mean, off they of were that, monsters they at were, that point. They were huge. And so the show just blew up. And the first day it went alive online, we had a million unique visitors. Um, and so Akamai's calling at the end of the second day and they're like, you got to give us more money to get, so like they're, they're, <laughs> yeah. we're having to like pay these guys to increase yep, the yep, ability yep, for us to yep. serve these streams. By the end of the first week, we had 5 million streams. By the second week, CBS called. And so we ended up selling the show to them. Um, they sat on it for like six months, didn't know what to do with it. And then in that time, Fear Factor came out, Big Brother came out, all these bigger reality shows. And so then they're like, well, we don't know what to do with it. We got the show back, sold it to MTV, ended up doing 250, or ended up doing 53 episodes for them. And then when they canceled that show in the fall of 2003, I said, well, let's take this money and let's make a movie. And we took the money that we made from that and made Super Size Me. Wow. Yeah. We'll get into that in a little bit, but let's get into the first phone calls, Andy, get that. I mean, like, Super Size Me, obviously, was the first time, you know, I'm, uh, some people know this, like, docs are really the only thing I consume. I love them, They're I so good. grew up on eating McDonald's, so I was super fired up. Um, that was a pretty awesome film, man. Like, oh, that changed everything, right? Like, it, you, that exploded. It exploded. It exploded, like, like, literally within, there was a moment at Sundance, I remember Sundance 2004 when we were there, where, and I'd watched, calling? Who's this? Hold on, Morgan. Yeah, sure. Sorry, this is how we do it. We interrupt the. What's that? Mel Mendoza. Mel? Mel. Mel. Cool. Let's Parkers see if Mel answers. West Virginia. No way. Hello? Mel, it's Gary V, and you're in the Ask Gary V show with Morgan. Gary V, holy crap. I can't believe I'm on the phone <laughs> with a guy from my home state and a guy I truly am inspired by, and Gary V. How you doing, man? We're doing super well. Say hello to Morgan. Hey, what's Morgan, up? Morgan, I'm calling from your I'm calling from your hometown of Parkersburg, West Virginia. That's what's where, up, bro? That is where I was born. That's fantastic. I mean, this is getting super meta. <laughs> Do you have a question for hey, us, Gary? Yes. Yeah. First thing, Gary, I was right by Wine Library over the uh, last week. I was going to stop in, but I'll try to stop in this week when, uh, when I do my business travel. Okay, so, so, so you did not stop in, but you still have a chance to stop in, right? I do, bro. Okay, well. I do, bro. And well, I, uh, I expect you to buy part? some product. I will. Okay. Morgan, <laughs> and I know that, uh, I know this format. Gary, thank you for taking my call. I know it's virtually impossible to get on. Morgan, I have a, a question for you, sir. Yes, sir. You know the you know the situation of your home state, bro. I mean, it's 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 the the uh, depressed, uh, highest overdoses of uh, of of everything, uh, heroin, coal mining industry. There's a lot of depressed, discouraged young people here. Yeah. What what suggestions would you give for those in this kind of a market that are trying to make their creative or entrepreneurial mark? Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing right now is people, and I say this about anything, and whether it's you know storytelling, making movies, or starting a uh, starting a new business, is that you you can't be afraid to take risks. And I think that I we we come from a state, and we grew up in a st- I grew up in a state where you know it is it is very rooted in being risk averse. I think that um, you like to do what works. We want to stick with what works. You know, whether it be the coal industry or whether it be something else. The idea of trying to you know overturn the apple cart is scary a lot of times. And I think what happens needs to happen right now is there needs to be some real investment, some real invention, some real dedication on bringing new businesses to the state, new opportunities to the state, um, because this is a state full of people who are passionate, who are hard workers, that I feel like would give 110% to whatever that is, but people are just 
uh, you know, whether it be unwilling to come there or people who live there leave to well, go somewhere else, problem, much like right? I did. Like I mean, keeping, that's a, all the tech the, talent goes to San Francisco. All le- the Hollywood talent goes to L.A. Or, yeah. you know, New, I mean, York, there was, New York gets everything. There was this whole thing that happened a few years ago where I believe it was when Manchin, who's now the senator, was the governor. And it was like they changed the slogan to West Virginia open for business. And it was like this uh, this slogan that I found to be, you know, such kind of a, a, a catch-22 because they wanted to bring new business there, yet the ability or potential or I guess the the flavor or desire to invest in new businesses was so small, well, that's it was the, really that's frustrating. The, listen, Mel, I think the one thing that everybody has to understand is you can trick entrepreneurs. That's right. Like, if I knew that I could open an office in West Virginia, in Morgansville, right now. That's right. And I could get a building for free, and it's tax free for five years. Vader Media is opening up, and I'm going to recruit everybody from WVU. That's right. Like tomorrow, it's just math. Yeah, and it's and it's a question of how much will the state kind pay. of uh, will will pay or open their doors to have these businesses when, come in. When these states stop spending money on dumb shit, yeah, that are inside baseball and servicing other random stuff, and yeah. realize that look, this has now been proven over the course of time. Humans are financially driven animals yeah. in a lot of ways. They're artistic as well. They're other things. That's right. But you know what I love about salespeople? They're trickable. Yeah. I'm very trickable. If the if Omaha, Nebraska, or Toronto, or or you know any place, Dayton, Tur- Dayton Ohio, Budapest, <laughs> yeah. anywhere, yeah. If somebody wants me, I'm open for business. Like right. Cancun can email me right now and say, <laughs> "Look, we've got ten million dollars for you." And that's what you actually are supposed to do. I actually think of it like athletes. Yeah. Like the Cavaliers suck until they get LeBron. Yeah. Like. The Bulls and Lakers suck right now. You know why? There's no Kobe or Michael Jordan walking through those doors. Yeah. If you want to build up the economy, trick the economic leader, entrepreneurs. I mean, you could be, look, if they pour $25 million into studios and talent, well, this and is, ta- like they could trick you to move. But, but you're this, happy you, in Brooklyn, you just, but you're, you'll you're, move. You're summing up uh, my next point of what I was going to say. This just happened as a storyteller and a filmmaker who's gone back and shot in West Virginia on at least six or seven projects I've gone back home to shoot. They've now eliminated the film office in West Virginia. They've cut it out of the budget. They've cut out the tax incentive for the state. So now why are people like me or storytellers? There's no incentive now to come back. And you can and only pay back so much, and they're right? gonna con- and, they're, and they're continuing to cut um, kind of this type of economic influence in the state, not just from filmmaking, but just from new business startups. So I would answer something more practical for your question, Mel. There's obviously the state. So the answer is the state has to get involved. The state has like, to get involved. Period. Like that's 100%. your answer, just so you know. Yeah. Now, the second thing of what you can do is groom extremely young talent. That's right. The one thing a human can do is focus on junior high and high school and create mentorship and like little hacks. Like the reason I created the 2017 Flip Challenge is like I want to inspire people like that didn't have as many dollars to start or as many opportunities to start. Like you've got to hack at a lower level. You're not going to start, you're not sending Morgan a heartfelt email that's going to make him pick up his family from Brooklyn and move. That's right. So you've got to start with Morgan, 13 years old, who's like, oh shit, I can make something or I can do a thing like email. You can email YouTube and Vimeo and other, like there's a lot, just pure effort of hacking, but it's reverse engineering selfishness. Yeah, and that's the thing is like, I go back and, and you know, I get approached all the time to th- do things back home, but I think in terms of entrepreneurship and building businesses, they have to incentivize they have to. people to come start. I mean, look, there's nonprofit and that's sure. why you've done it, right? There's yeah. nonprofit. I do a lot of things out of the goodness of my heart. I just think that the way to trick me is through the business and the game, not through, you gotta trick through the the head and the brain, not just the heart. The heart is able, Morgan's gonna do a shitload for West Virginia when he's 80 and he's got it out of his system. <laughs> like, you have to understand that's real. That's It's real. It's easier at different parts in your life when you're yeah. still gunning. Like, you know, it's you, you give and plenty of people give while they're gunning, but it's just a lot easier to give Give yeah. when you're not gunning. Yeah. And I think that's super important. That's why that's why people teach. That's why she's gonna teach this year. She's seventy four. She's yeah. done gunning. She like and so I think I think that's something you, you got you gotta be very practical, my man. Understood? Sure. Hey Gary V, thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, I bought you I bought Crush It at a bookstore that no longer exists when it came out here in West Virginia. Been a follower ever since, man. Thanks for the inspiration. You, you got it, brother. Life, Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks, Val. Man, he really drilled it at the end, right? He was like, bought it from a bookstore that doesn't exist anymore. Put a real dagger through <laughs> the heart. He's like, listen, it's really ironic. A lot of Jersey kids. Yeah. Uh, my entire high school friend 
circle, 60% of them went to West Virginia, which is ironic. And so, and also the New York Jets yeah. drafted Geno Smith. I know. So, and I Anthony was, Beck. I, I was so hopeful when that happened. Yeah, me too. I was, I was believing. And Anthony Beck, tight end, first round pick from West Virginia. I've got a lot of love for West Virginia. Reggie Rembert, yeah. if you want to go back old school. That's old school. <laughs> uh, I've got a lot of. Who are we calling now? Kimberly. Let's see what Kimberly Where's Kimberly live? Say. We're about to find out. <laughs> he does not know. Hello? Kimberly, this is Gary V, and you're in the Ask Gary V show with Morgan. Oh my God. Oh, I can't believe this. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It, How are y'all? We're, we're good. Super well. Where are you from? I'm from Houston, Texas. Very nice. What's your question? So, my question is um, I'm a writer and a, a poet. And I, the part I struggle with is uh, monetizing myself. Uh, I'm very creative. I would like to say that I am excellent at putting out content. Um, I'm documenting myself. I have no problem being in front of my uh, iPhone at any given time. Um, I'm always writing. I'm always creating every day. And so my question is, though, I struggle with, okay, I'm doing all this great work or you know making my work um uh, putting it out there but how do i make a living at this in in a in a big way or or how do i monetize uh because i like being the creative and not so good at being the one that you know yeah the, the i mean kim and, kim this is literally the most cliche story of our time yeah artist versus business person and the artists that tend to break out either have the business person partner or they happen to have business DNA as well. Yeah. The artists that everybody knows are stunningly salespeople and marketers and, and business people. Very savvy. A hundred percent. Yeah. Morgan, I'm gonna let you take the first crack at this because this must be so cliche. This is literally all the time. everybody you grew up with. Oh, and it's and it's and so many people I meet all the time. It's like, how do I just turn this into you know you and you don't just want a job. I mean, because in the beginning you want to chip away and you want to get jobs. You want to get people who are gonna pay you to do this thing you love, to do this job, but you need to turn that also right. into a career. You want it to be something that you're gonna get to do forever. So you never have to offset yeah. that with job X or job Y. You know, you never have to do something else to kind of offset the income. But in the beginning, the biggest thing is you should take as many jobs as you can, as much as you can, that is in this space. That doesn't mean you can't still be doing other things, but as a writer and as a creative person, you need to be doing as many things as you can to kind of fulfill that creative, quote unquote, job for yourself. And, and you shouldn't be doing, and there's a lot of people who will say, well, I can't really pay you. You shouldn't do those jobs for free. You know, unless it's something okay. like you really feel like that is great or it's a great opportunity, then you can do those for free. But I think you have to limit the amount of like the ones you do for nothing because the more you start doing really creative or artistic jobs for free, the more people are gonna expect that you'll do them for free. And I think you have to start to build kind of a responsibility to yourself as a creative person to start getting paid for the work you do and you care about. But I think I think that's right. And I think that the reality is, is there's one other variable, which is I think the majority of artists out there need to start thinking about a partner who owns 20 to 50% of their lives. Yeah. Like especially, yeah. Kim, how long have you done this? I've been writing, I've been writing my whole life. I've been serious about it um, as far as putting stuff out there for about five years. Right, I've so. Been super serious about it for six months. <laughs> okay, so I think at this point, it sounds like you're self, like if you're an 18 year old kid and you're not sure, yeah. you don't give up, you know, don't let me come in and take 50% of the action because I figured it out and you didn't yet. But it sounds like you're already at a point in your life where it would be a dream to be 50 50 partners with me or 20%, somebody owns 20% who's the salesperson. Yeah. I am yeah. stunned by how many artists haven't figured out that they have zero chance unless they bring in a business partner and it's the kind of business, when you have no money, you're not paying some business kid you know, 150,000 to be your business partner, you're gonna have to give up economics. It's sweat equity. And there's a yeah. ton, and by the way, now let's reverse it so everybody doesn't think this is the business guy talking. Yeah. The amount of business people, probably way more watching and listening right now, the amount of business people who can't build an interesting product yeah. or will have yeah. nothing worth selling their, ever in their lives is stunning. There's a lot. And they're a lot better to find an artist who makes great shit yeah. and make 50% of that. So it's amazing to me that the artist and the business salesperson have such an incredible match, yet they're both stubborn 
in getting to that middle place because salespeople are selling dog shit and, <laughs> and, 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 and lose and artists are making incredible shit but nobody's ever gonna see it because they can't sell for lick. Yeah. Right. Yeah, how do I find that person? Because I everything, am- everything, everything you do right now should be about that. You should go to the Chamber of Commerce events yeah. where there's business people. Every post on social media should be I'm looking because you know your college friend's brother or sister might be that great. But your behavior has to show yeah. that everything you care about right now is finding that part. And you can't be you, thinking it. Yeah, in Houston, Texas, there that person is there. Houston is a big enough city okay. filled with enough both creative and business minded folks that you can find that person who will be there to compliment you. And, I'll, right. and, and Gary's right. Like I've got a business partner who started off 13 years ago as my assistant, like right after Super Supersize Me came out in theaters. And now together, he's my partner. I've got another partner now at my company. There's three of us. And we've grown our company to now 65 people. So I think that you have to, you have to look at what you're willing to grow, what you're willing to sacrifice, and what it can turn into. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm like, hey, come along with me. Whatever we can sell together, then yeah, you get a piece of it. You know, I'm not like sitting here going, you know, trying to count my pennies. You but know, how, how, I, how aggressive have you been in trying to find that person? For real, don't bullshit Morgan. No, I, I haven't because literally the idea, it, it, it kind of sat with me, but I always felt like it, I wasn't a good entrepreneur if I was, I was being a crybaby if I wanted to have a partner. No, you know no, no, I mean? no, no, no. But it's also great it's realizing. So, yeah. It's also great realizing you can't do it. Do everything. Like I'm a great creative person. I understand business. And I'm a great salesperson. But at some point, you do need somebody to help you if you really want to create yeah. something that can scale and grow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, entrepreneurship is about winning at all costs fairly in a wide open game. That's right. Partnerships are a huge part of that. It's having the humility and self-awareness. I'm glad you called. So real quick, what's your email? Uh, my email is Kim Block Beauty, uh, Kim Block Beauty Bar at gmail.com. Okay, good. Uh, for the podcast, that's gonna be do good luck. But for the show, we're gonna get mm-hmm. that email. From Jake, you're gonna figure that out one more time. Like, let's really get that email. You've got the info. We're gonna we're gonna put that email here. You're about to get 713 emails from business salespeople. Spend a month interview and Skype and call with all of them, and you will literally have a business partner in the next 30 days. Awesome. It's awesome. awesome. All right. I'm so fucking- <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Thanks. I think she was gonna say she's so fucking pumped. <laughs> I think it's where she was going, right? I think that's what we had. So while, while Andy's pulling up that next number, S- Sundance. Yeah. You can taste it on day two. Oh, so, so here's the thing. So the movie, the movie took off. The movie exploded out of Sundance and somebody stops me at the film festival, um, it was a, it was a it was a it was a movie reviewer named James Rocky who he says so um, and, and and now go back like I'd grown up my whole life watching Sundance you right. know it's where people came into these these the festival with these little movies that nobody had heard of that literally changed their changed lives their forever lives. So whether, whether you're you the Coen Brothers whether you're Kevin Smith you're Quentin Tarantino you're Robert Rodriguez you know I've you know you've been watching this my whole life and so suddenly I'm there in 2004. And James Rocky comes up to me and he says, so how does it feel to be the bell of the ball? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, this is your, this is your Sundance, Mr. Spurlock. And at that moment, like, like, listen, I'm getting chills just right now telling you this story because at that moment, I realized, holy shit, I'm that guy. I'm the guy, I'm Cinderella. I'm, the guy, who ca- I'm the guy who came in with the movie I made for nothing, who was gonna walk out of here and my life's never gonna be the same. And you knew it right away. And it, was, it hit me at that moment like that's, that's this is and exactly. And that's what happened, right? That's what happened. My so life, give me my the, life. Give me the next minute, what happens next day? Like you're just getting pounded? Pounded with press, pounded with opportunities, pounded with phone calls. Who and- was the coolest phone call you got? who was the coolest phone call? I don't know. I mean, I got called by a lot of movie studios, which is a young filmmaker, you know, dream. Uh, just dream, dream. Like when studios are calling you saying, we want to come, can you come meet with us? And you know what's great about social media now? Yeah. Like, and this was, again, this was, yeah, there was no social great. media back what's then. What's cool about social Nobody, media now yeah. is like somebody uber famous just tweets like, oh my God, this film was incredible. Like you didn't, like all the famous people that you looked up to, yeah. you didn't actually really know. It never got to you. That's right. But they thought your film was awesome. That's right, until I would like see them somewhere or meet people somewhere and it was pretty, pretty amazing. How much weight did you gain again? 26 pounds over the course of a month. Oh, I can gain that over across a weekend. That's right. It doesn't seem that much now in hindsight. Now that I'm older, it doesn't I feel like seem... I, I was slacking. I, How I, long did you lose it? How... It, took, it, took, it took me over a year to get it off and keep it off. Because losing it's easy, problem. keeping it off is the hard part. Yeah. I do love chicken nuggets, man. I love, I just love, I just love fried chicken, period. Yeah, I get it. All right, yeah. Justin? Hey. Justin, Gary hey. V on the Ask Gary V Show with Morgan Spurlock. How are you? Good. Um, 
All right, I, I'm running out of ideas. I just want to see what your thoughts are. If you're running, if you're to, if you were given a, a client that says, "Hey, run a campaign for us for a luxury underwear company." Okay, so are you on the creative side or on the media amplification side or both? Where are you sitting? Both. Right. So I think yeah, I both. think and, I think, and this is men's or women's or. It's it's men's and women's. Even though I think there's a bigger market for women's, they're starting with men. So it's starting with men. Yep. Okay, I would hang up the phone right now and I would direct message every dude on Instagram that has 500,000 followers or more and tell them that you need to blow up this underwear brand, what do they want? Okay. And, and that's it, bro. And I'm telling you right now, now you'll get blocked after a certain amount, then you'll go to Twitter. This is literally hardcore knocking on doors. Good looking dude models on Instagram, athletes, even comedians, even non-good looking dudes wearing that underwear, the exposure for the cost is so low and it's instant, instant impact on the brand. Make sure the URL on the Instagram account is linking to the cart. Make sure your, your, make sure their Instagram account of this brand has 15 to 20 pieces of content on it that look the part, looks right. Um, and then you just literally biz dev your job here is to be the architect of the success, not the creative director or the media planner. This is literally just siphoning the underpriced nature of personal brands on Instagram, which is very visual. This is underwear. This is a fucking layup. And when you ask them what they want, they're pretty much gonna say, just give me free, free underwear? No, they're gonna ask you for fucking money, bro. So <laughs> what you need to figure out is how much money you have. Now, if you hit up somebody who's extremely good looking but doesn't have a big audience, like Andy. If you hit up Andy, Andy, how many followers do you have on Instagram? 10,000. Oh, Andy, you're very, and you're very too, good looking. You got most of that, most of that. Andy yeah, right. that's right. So, all right, so Morgan, how many followers do you have on Instagram? Do you have any uh, idea? I me like 18,000. Great, Andy. Yeah. This is huge. Mm-hmm. So Morgan's a perfect example of who not to hit up. He's, <laughs> he's uber famous. No, he's too famous for the reach he has on Instagram. So he's not gonna take four bucks to post an underwear, right? And, and Plus, I, nobody wants to see me in my I underwear. Do. That's your I do. No, I actually think, I think you need to have a mix of like Ronaldo and like Jake, right? Like we have to like mix it up, right? Like, well, that's yeah. a, that's what I think. I think you should find. I think you should find some of the people who are the least attractive people on Instagram, and like, also get them underwear. And by and the say, way, and, by and, the and way. have and have this campaign be like we all want, we all want to feel good naked, and no, yeah, because we all no, want to feel, he, we all want to feel good in our underwear. As long as that person has a ton of followers. That's right. Right, so like to me, I agree. Like I think you should go to anybody if they have a million followers. The problem is they're gonna ask for money. So the question is, do you have any? If you don't, yeah. you've gotta change it up again, which is if you wanna be successful for this brand, you can hit them up and say, hey man, we, I, I'm working with this one client. I'd love for you to post. You have 87,000 followers. I'd love you to post. On the flip side, I'll make three pieces of content for you, for your account. You gotta make a trade. Life's about trades, right? We started with this with the state, whether it's the state and a person, whether it's two people with a business in the middle, it's all about trades. And so you need to figure out the influencer market on Instagram, the price, the value, because that's where the action is, especially for something as visual as an underwear brand. How much money do you want to wear the underwear? I've never done a brand deal in my entire life, so whatever the current value of the New York Jets is, so for $2.1 billion, <laughs> I'll wear that underwear for the rest of my life. But I, look, and it's ironic, and it's a great question, you're gonna make this piece of content more valuable. I don't do brand stuff because I've decided to build an agency, I've done other things. So like everybody's got their own thing, right? Like there's a lot of, but for example, let me give you a good one. Braxton Miller? Jalen Reeves Maben, John Toth, guys that work at Vayner Sports, guys that are signed to Vayner Sports. Because I so desperately want them to be successful and to show the sports world that I'm good, I would do something. Maybe I would be in the video of the producing of the video commercial for Braxton in his underwear, which then I could share on my channels. There's a way to get me. Literally, the answer to your question is probably $500,000, because the million dollar man's right. Right, everybody's got a price, right? But by the way, I'm not even remotely close to 500,000. But if you gave but if you gave one of my athletes 35k, 
I'd probably give you the same amplification because I need that to work. So now look, those are big numbers. You're probably dealing with a start up, startup. So you have to go to people that want 500 bucks, 100 bucks, 1,000, a free lunch, some free content. Yeah. And so maybe you're not gonna get people with millions, but guess what? 7,000 here, 9,000 there. And what one thing I would highly recommend is attractive people. Attractive people is an arbitrage in life. If you're yeah. good looking, life is better. So you might be able to get somebody who has 6,000 followers. Who's really, really good who's looking. Who's really good looking. Yeah. And it just might have the right 6,000 people paying attention to that dude. And so you're gonna have to get educated on it. But the, the macro answer is Instagram influencers. I know that for fact. You just have to build up your skills on it. Got it? Yep, got it. Thank you, sir. You got it, brother. All right, let's get one more while Morgan finishes off this super. Side. So what happened next? What was the project after that? So that blew well, up, best, you became well, the, a big deal. Everybody knows who you are now, well, what this, happens? This leads me to something else that I, I, I think that what people also have to understand about whether it's creative process or running a business is you should always, you need to be playing chess and not checkers. You need to be 16 moves ahead. You need to have a sense of this isn't what I'm doing next. This is what I'm doing next. This is what I wanna do after that and what I'm doing after that. You need to have the things in the pipeline lined up behind whatever this thing that explodes is so you're prepared to react. And so on the heels of us selling Super Size Me out of Sundance, we already knew what was next. We went to LA. I already knew we were spinning this off into a TV show. We wanted to make a show where we could immerse people into these different environments and force them to kind of defend their beliefs. And that show became 30 Days, the show that we did three seasons of for Netflix. Yep. And it was amazing. But but we, we literally went from Sundance the next week and sold that show to FX before the movie was ever out, before you know it had ever hit theaters. Um, and it was it was smart, but we kind of had a we had a path of what we wanted our what I wanted my career and kind of the next creative process to be. What's the project you really want to do that hasn't that you haven't gotten off the ground yet? That, yeah, that, no, it's like that you've got three fourths of it in your head. Yeah, there's what's, a couple. What's floating in that brain of yours? You know, we there's a couple big um, there's a couple big projects. Like there's a couple big scripted projects that we've been dancing around that uh, knock on wood we'll be able to to pull off. Like for me to do a big scripted film would be phenomenal to do a big narrative film. And what kind of genre? Um, I mean, I think that- uh, Romantic comedy, sci-fi, not, like, I drama. Love, listen, I love I love sci-fi, but I think the, the first path in for us before I can do like the big sci-fi that I yeah. would love to make is I want to do something that's a bit more of a, it's a bit more of a comedy, like a, a, like a dramedy, something that deals yeah. with, so, yep. something that's I think historical yep. in nature. Like okay. I, right now there's a movie that, uh, that I hope we can pull off that is all about, um, it's based on a book called Ping Pong Diplomacy. That's all about how in the 70s. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, it's like this amazing film how in the 70s. China it was the, all yep. about China and the US and how literally a ping pong tournament yeah, was what out. opened ping pong. 100%. Uh, opened US China relations. I love that. It's awesome. That's cool. And then you want to do Star Wars 29? <laughs> <laughs> well, now apparently the Han Solo job just got filled. So yeah, Ronnie. <laughs> Ronnie. Yeah, it's Ronnie. It's Ronnie. Okay. That you guy. look like at Ronnie a little bit in some That's weird good. way. I, it's like, yeah, do you, actually, you actually do have Ronnie like characteristics. We, we've got characters. Yeah, we're both like you know just just like sweet Blonde gingers, yeah, nice yeah. gingers. Soon, I'm, my, I'm, have you met yeah, Ronnie? I have a bit more hair than he does. I I just met him like a like a couple months ago. Nicest he's guy. He's a good dude. He's the great. He's yeah, like such a super great guy. Nice. Yeah, he and I had a. Hello? Oh, hello. Hey, this is yeah. Gary V on the Ask Gary V Show, and Andy doesn't know your name. Who are you? Hey, I'm, man, I can't believe this. Uh, my name is Talk to Bill from that show, but I'm uh, from uh, former Soviet country as well. Uh, you can call me Bill. No problem. How are you? I can call you what? I want to make sure I hear this right. Sorry, what? What, what can we call you? Bill. Bill? Or yeah. Gil. Gil or Bill? G-I-L or B-I-L-L? B-I-L-L. Bill. Bill. I, I was right, Morgan. You are right. One, Bill. zero, Bill. Gary. Bill, <laughs> first of all, you know, I've got a tough name. Your name is incredible. And I appreciate uh, being able to call you Bill. And I will practice to call you by your appropriate name. Where, where are you now? I'm actually in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Very nice. So from the former Soviet Union like me, in Minnesota now, uh, what is your question, my friend? My impression? Uh, no, your qu- yes. Well, you actually, impression, what, what is, is your impression? impression? Yes. No, no, do an impression. We, we, need, we need an impression both. first. Or your impression on us, and then a question. I want both the impression oh. and the question. Oh, okay. So I know, man. So I'm from Mongolia, former Soviet country as well. And Gary, you are becoming a very big figure in Mongolia as well. So like, um, today is actually a big day is happening in Mongolia. Today is a presidential election, and 
Mongolians are tending to be choose first very entrepreneur yes. president for yes. the first time. Yes. And I would say like you had a, a great impact on that as well because like um, lots of millennials have been like introducing you to their audience in Mongolia. So hold on, Bill. So Before I, you go any further, yeah. I just want to make sure I quantify this. Are you saying that I'm having an impact on the Mongolian presidential election right now? Yes, but okay. not as high, but minimum like impact. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm obviously making a joke, <laughs> but I'm stunningly flattered. Even huge. if I'm having a point zero 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 one percent Huge in Mongolia. I appreciate it, Bill. Thank you for that. And your question for Morgan and I? Well, Do you so have I'm, one? An international, I'm an international student from Mongolia you know, yes. in the United States. Yes. So I'm on an international student visa. Yes. So if you if you can say I, I actually have like a less right than a legal immigrant in some situations. So what would be your suggestions to international student who is trying to start his business in United States, but trying to not just be restricted in the United States, but also in Mongolia and United States, like, have tried to have a connection. Yeah, yeah, I think I think there's so I think you take advantage of the time that you're here and you and you mm-hmm. do practical things, not romantic things. Yeah. Now, I wouldn't force what I'm about to say, but it would be the, the thing that would be on my mind. My second day, my excuse me, my first day of high school, there was a kid in my homeroom named Brandon Warnicky who I hit it off with. Actually, I laughed I laughed at the way they pronounced his name and then everybody laughed, so he hated me for the first day. <laughs> but later, we became very good friends. And literally, literally, I knew that I was looking for a business partner in my future, my freshman year of high school. And to this day, here we are 27 years later, and Brandon Warnicky runs the wine library with my dad. So, so what I would say is, while you're here, finding somebody that you trust that could Mm -hmm. become your business partner, if the circumstances don't allow you to stay here in the US that could hold down US operations would be Mm -hmm. my number one. I would literally meet people, meet people at scale. Every second meeting people, that would be, the two things I would try to do if I were you based on the question is, learn the American culture of business and the market Mm -hmm. and meet Mm -hmm. as many people as possible who could be future collaborators, whether as extreme as a business partner or just mm. business connections for the next 80 years. Morgan? That's, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great suggestion because I, when I look at my, like my, the, the film business as is, as is just the investment business, it's a very incestuous universe. Like people go from job to job to job and it becomes a, as big as you think the pool is, it does become a much smaller pool of people who really have control and influence and can help shape things. And the more you pe- meet the people now that are within these positions or that are on, kind of on the hockey stick up, you meet them, they're kind of on a track to, to become a manager here, run this side of a division here, invest here. Like, and, like identifying those people now as they will continue to grow in those opportunities are going to be the people that five years from now, 10 years from now, are going to be the people that are going to be running the companies you want to work with. And, and I love all the time how many of the people that I start out in the film business now that are, that are really... Players. Be, players, players, players at agencies, players at studios. Bill, it's incredible. Bill, life, life is only about relationships, and it's compounded in former dictatorships and communist countries where relationship is the currency. Yeah. You know, here, <laughs> here, back to a meeting I had earlier today where he said, "What's amazing about America is no matter where your fa- family started, he said whether slavery or immigration, mm-hmm. somewhere eventually in your family line, there's an opportunity." West Virginia is not the hotbed, right? So, Completely. Bill, I would say you've got to triple down on your relationship investment as many people as you can meet. As many, the Chamber of Commerce in Minnesota, meetup.com, every Minnesota meetup that has entrepreneurs and business people, go to them, shake hands, kiss babies, build relationships. Wow, okay. I never thought about that, to be honest. Bill, Thank you, guys. That's and, incredible. And, and that excites me, and it's funny that I gave you that advice because it is a very common cliche, stereotypical uh, characteristic of Eastern European non-US business people to not be kind of shake hands. You know, we keep to ourselves in the former USSR, right? Yeah. So I gave you that advice kind of out of intuition as well. I don't think, so people don't realize how much it's the people part and not the movie you make, the product you sell, the big idea you come up with. It'll be, I'm really happy you called and got through because I think it's great advice for you, but I also think it's great advice for a lot of people listening and watching. 
All right, wonderful. That's incredible. Thank you so much, Gary and Morgan. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank take you. Care. And the amazing thing, since you are huge in Mongolia, we just made a movie about Mongolia that now everybody can see. It's on. Uh, it came out in theaters, was shortlisted for an Oscar last year, called The Eagle Huntress. Which people should watch. You're being dead serious. I'm being dead serious. We made a movie. It was. It was. Uh, we produced it. It was directed by uh, a guy you know named Otto you Bell. Loved it? You loved it's, it. Yeah. It's a beautiful movie. So it's about this father who teaches his 13 year old daughter to become an eagle hunter. Is it? Is it? Would it be impactful for you for it to get a second bump and do well on like? I, th- I think. Listen. Anytime. As I love when people watch docs. Anytime yeah. anybody watch and share docs, uh, I think it's great. But this just kind of hit iTunes and is out into the universe. Um, so people should check it out. It's a beautiful movie. Well, so movie. with my newfound massive leverage yes. in Mongolia, yeah, can I we feel- make a transaction here? Like, if I can get seven percent of the upside on the back end of this movie, I think in you'll, iTunes, you'll have to talk to Sony Pictures Classics under- on that oh, one. Damn it! Yeah. <laughs> so much better to talk to a human being. All right, we're, we're not going to do any more calls. I think we did well there, Morgan. You know, given you know, you have a lot of what I would call artistic business focused people. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of people creating content. I, I said something around documenting versus creating which I tried to create as a framework of not crippling people and just kind of like go reality TV doc on your phone because yeah. you, people are stuck yeah. in making. Well, Any, this, anything you can add to the young audience well, right this, now? Well, one of the greatest things a photographer friend, I'm, a friend of mine said, and it's a photographer adage that everybody says, is like, what's your favorite camera? And the and the answer is whichever one I have in my hand. So I think that no matter what you're shooting, no matter where you are, if the only thing you have to document whatever you're doing is this to tell a story with is awesome. The amazing thing is we live in a time now where we used to be like, oh my God, it's so shaky. That's all gone. Like this has all been flown out the window. People don't give a shit about quality. Nope. They don't give a shit about how it's edited. They don't give a shit about how it looks. They want it's the all story. About, it's about the story. What's the story? You tell me a good story, I can put up with this. Morgan, when I and, when I and, launched Wine Library TV yeah. in 2006. It didn't look good. No. It did not, I remember. Do you remember it? I do, I remember. Did it catch your radar? It did, of course. It makes me happy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, but people, it was the story. Of course, people were like, you look like a hostage in the Middle East. I'm but, like, cool. But you, were, but you were also a guy <laughs> who was waxing rhapsodic about wine in a way that everybody could finally understand. Finally. Like, here you were. Here was some guy who wasn't making me like feel like an idiot for talking to me about wine in a, in a way that I had to have a PhD to understand. I didn't have to be a master of wine to watch your that's show. That's right. And I think that's what that's what was brilliant. Tell me, uh, tell me, Tell me one last rant, because I don't want to let you go. <laughs> one, one last thing on culture, movie making, social media. Well, give, us, give us a couple, give us a couple 360 seconds Well, here's the thing. This, this is for, head. Well, this is for all the storytellers that are out there. No matter who you are, what you're doing. Now is the greatest time in the history of our culture, in the history of media, in the history of storytelling to be a storyteller. Period. There are more places to tell your stories. There are more places to sell your stories. Yeah, there let's are talk, more stop places. right there. Stop yeah. right there. Hulu, Facebook, Netflix. I mean, Amazon, yeah. it's insane. It's insane. You know, all the Are way you through, like, oh my God? It's it's so exciting. To Facebook Live, to, to the countless digital platforms, the fact that I can now tell a story and reach somebody in the palm of their hand is exciting. To have this direct one-to-one relationship is amazing. And I can make things now that are two hours long that I can sell into a theatrical release. I can make things that are one hour long that can have a traditional television or a digital release. Or I can make something that's five minutes long and affect and, affect and impact somebody in, in just the same way. In your career... In your balance of your career, your family, yeah, do you have a little sliver that you can create to be a little bit more out there and do a podcast, a vlog, a Q and A show? Like I was so excited to have you on this. Yeah. I've had a lot of interesting different people, but I feel like where are you at with putting yourself out there and engaging with the audience where it's you, not you're doing some interviews with the, where yeah. do you sit on that thesis? No, I think I think that you're you're hitting the nail on the head is that for so long I've focused on yes. our traditional production and the way we're doing that this is exactly what's happening right now. Good. Yeah. I'd love to talk to you off this like I think you guys I can't think, be a part of this conversation. No, you That's guys are out. Saying. You guys no, are out of but this. I, I, but I wish I wish you guys could see like the, how this whole setup is. Underneath this camera, they have the camera wrapped around a box of Dom Perignon. Is the, That's is how there, Gary there, V rolls. Is Dom there in there? There is a box. There's of a Dom. bottle in there. There's a. There's, it's I a, love the it. The cameras are wrapped around a I box of Dom Perignon. That's how we roll, man. Class act. You know, king of Mongolia, right here. <laughs> king of Mongolia. It's true, Morgan. <laughs> I am the king of Mongolia. I, I, Actually, Presidential Mongolia, election. By the way, Mongolian kings. Please. Good historical references. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, and finally, where where are you now? So that's why I asked. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of people who may want to reach out. This would be a good sure. spring point. Where is the best place to kind of, if they're going to be able to capture your attention, is it email, is it Twitter? Where's yeah, the spot like, to it's get like you? I run all my own social media, so yes. it's like they can get me through Instagram. But where's is, the real place? Is it Twitter? It's, it's Yeah, it's Instagram, it's Twitter, it's Facebook. Instagram comments, will you see them engage or is it more likely to pan, hit reply you on Twitter? And you Like which one will get you? I get, I reply to all of them. 
I reply to everyone, no matter where it is. I reply to everyone on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. Get ready, my friend. Yeah, awesome. Question of the day. Question of the day? You get to ask the question of the day. Every guest on this show, yeah. thanks for watching, yeah. gets to ask the question of the day. Yeah. Anything you want, thousands of answers, fire away. Thousands of answers. I, I wish I would have known that I could you have asked this. You could market research. I yeah. wish I could have done well, a listen, little Listen, if you fucking watched the show, we would have had a, you know, that's where I was kind of. <laughs> what? My question of the yeah. day. Anything you want. Like, I'll give you a second here. I'll buy you some time. Sure. Something, you know, this could be a good market. And does it have to, does it have to apply to my life? No. Nope. could be a question nope. in general. It could be about like, do you like oranges or apples better? Or. Yeah. If you'd like to be smarter, as you can think about the four to seven projects that are running through your head, yeah. you might be able to get some consumer insights at scale here. Yes. You might be able to scratch your itch on, maybe there's a debate that you've had with your buddy from junior high for the last 31 <laughs> years. Maybe you're a hardcore Reddit fan like, and there's something going on. Like, I don't know. Yeah. What do you got? These are all good questions. Uh, thank you. I was trying yeah. to set you see, up. I see, but since you talked about the podcast, maybe that's the question we should ask. I don't know. So don't look at me. I look was, at them. If I was going to do a podcast, what should that podcast be? That was a very good question. You tell me. Love it. Thank you, my man. Great to see you, Gary. Really, Appreciate really. It. This was a lot Thank of fun. You. This is yeah. awesome. You keep asking questions, we'll keep answering them.